According to recent studies, chronic heartburn affects almost 60 million Americans, and if left untreated and becomes severe, has been linked with esophageal cancer. Unfortunately, most esophageal cancers have a poor prognosis and do not cause symptoms until they've reached an advanced stage when they are harder to treat. As the incidence of esophageal cancer continues to rise, the need for early detection and advancements in screening modalities is paramount. My name is Dr. William Orsini. I'm 73 years of age. I'm a practicing dermatologist in Monmouth County, New Jersey, and have been so for 42 years. I had intermittent heartburn for probably about 10 years, and I would take antacids periodically to alleviate the heartburn. And I never thought anything of it until I developed a cough that was somewhat debilitating and uh, in giving lectures and conversing with patients, it was, uh, it was compromising. So in an attempt to find out what the etiology of the cough was, I sought out medical help and a pulmonologist suggested that the cough was probably not, okay, related to my upper respiratory tract, but in fact, probably gastrointestinal. And the first endoscopy was, was basically uh, uninformative, showed just normal esophagitis. The doctor recommended I have a, an annual surveillance. I took it very seriously and uh, listened to my doctor and went in annually for uh, endoscopies. Two years subsequent to that, I had another endoscopy, and a week later, the diagnosis was confirmed that it was Barrett's esophagus. That was a wake-up call. One of the most common precancerous conditions of the esophagus, Barrett's esophagus, is thought to be preceded by chronic gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD. The American College of Gastroenterology has established screening and surveillance recommendations for high-risk patients. Access Health recently caught up with the director of the esophageal program, gastroenterologist, Dr. Michael Smith, to learn more. About one in 10 patients who have chronic uncontrolled reflux disease can develop Barrett's esophagus. Developing Barrett's esophagus is important because those patients are at a much higher risk of developing cancer of the esophagus related to their reflux disease. A patient develops Barrett's esophagus because over time, the acid and bile and other digestive juices and contents of the stomach that are bubbling up into the lower esophagus are irritating the esophagus to the point that the cells inside the esophagus wall change. And it's that change in cell type that generates the risk of cancer. When a patient comes to my office and I'm wondering whether or not there's someone who might develop or have developed Barrett's esophagus and are at risk of developing cancer of the esophagus related to reflux, we have to think about the risk factors that come to mind that put them at higher risk of developing that condition. Those include a history of reflux that's been going on at least five years, generally that's been uncontrolled, that they are male, over age 50, Caucasian or white, that they have central obesity, which means that they have obesity around their midline, that they are a current or past smoker, or that they have a family history of either Barrett's esophagus or esophageal adenocarcinoma. While the most common group of people to develop Barrett's esophagus are obese white males, it doesn't mean that everyone who develops Barrett's esophagus is an obese white male. Everyone who has long-standing reflux disease is at risk for developing this condition. When I had the, the diagnosis of, of uh, Barrett's esophagus, they, they noted to be high-grade dysplasia, which is a likely candidate to someday transition to esophageal cancer. The majority of patients who develop Barrett's esophagus have the most benign type, called non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus. When you look at those cells under the microscope after they've been biopsied, we see normal-looking intestinal cells. They're just in the wrong place in the body. They're from the esophagus. But those cells can acquire changes in how they look, how they interact with the other cells around them. And those changes, which are more advanced, are called dysplasia. So it's important to try and find patients as early as possible and to know that once they've started to develop dysplasia, now's the time to act and try and get rid of those precancerous cells. My gastroenterologist at the time suggested that I seek out the services of a Dr. Michael Smith, who at the time was doing a, a rather novel procedure. And uh, I had three ovation treatments at three month intervals and subsequently had biopsies and the biopsies revealed no evidence of, of uh, Barrett's esophagus. And then I went back 
uh, on every three months, six months, on a yearly basis. Seven years later, the Barrett's returned. I had two more oblations, and I go back now on an annual basis, and there's no uh, recurrence of the Barrett's esophagus. At this point in time, I have no cough, no heartburn. I'm asymptomatic, but I'm not taking it lightly, and I, I go back for my annual endoscopies. Dr. Smith basically saved my life. If one develops esophageal cancer, the prognosis is very grave. I, I'm indebted to him. In the last few decades, we've made tremendous strides in our ability to treat patients who have Barrett's esophagus, to get rid of their precancerous cells before they become cancer, and even get rid of early cancers in a life-saving way. The problem is that we still have a lot of work to do to do a better job of screening our patients who might be at risk of this condition. In the United States, there are approximately 900,000 high-risk patients a year getting screened for Barrett's esophagus using endoscopy. However, there are no mass screening programs in place for those at risk without the typical symptoms. The tough part about my job is that the 40% of patients or so who don't have any symptoms that relate to reflux disease are never getting to me to begin with. And they don't even know that they need to go to a doctor to get checked for this condition because they're not feeling anything that's out of the ordinary. And the problem is that we don't necessarily have all the resources to put an endoscope down everyone when they turn 50 years old to see whether or not they have reflux. Even the ones that are at higher risk. What I'm excited about in our field is that recently there are new tools available that allow us to look for those precancerous cells that don't involve endoscopy, that don't involve putting a patient under sedation, that could be done in a doctor's office, that could be done in a laboratory. It only takes about five minutes of the patient's time, and when the result comes back, they'll know whether or not they have this precancerous condition and need to go into a surveillance program. One such test that has been making the rounds is ESOGARD, an esophageal DNA test for Barrett's esophagus and other known precursors to esophageal cancer. Doctors perform a non-invasive, office-based procedure to safely and simply sample cells from the esophagus in order to be sent for analysis. Here's how it works. In most cases, patients swallow a balloon capsule similar in size to a typical daily vitamin tablet. The textured balloon swabs the surface of the distal esophagus to collect the cells used for analysis. Studies have found that it is highly accurate at detecting Barrett's esophagus and other known precursors to esophageal cancer. My hope for the future is that our new tools and technologies will allow us to screen all of the patients who are at risk for Barrett's esophagus, to find the ones who have the condition, and more successfully manage them to prevent any cancers related to reflux disease from ever forming. As with most cancers, the hope for better survival rates lies in early detection and treatment. For more information on our story today, visit esoguard.com, or as always, you can go to our website, accesshealth.tv.